first video for chemical bonding for the uh, 2018 um, fall semester. So what I'd like to focus on in this particular video is going to be significant figures, where they come from, what they are, and how to use them. So the first thing that we have to remember about significant figures or significant digits is that they actually come directly from actual measurements that we make in the lab. So for example, if we want to um, obtain the mass of a particular um, object using, for example, a four-place um, balance, we might find that mass to be, on measure, 12.5112 grams. Now we know that that particular balance is good to the fourth decimal place, which I'll just underline right here, so that tells us that I'm going to have significance to that fourth decimal place. So what that means in this particular case is that I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures in that particular measurement. Another example of this is if we were to make a volume measurement using, for example, a graduated cylinder. So in this particular case, I've got a graduated cylinder with a liquid level in it, and I'm measuring between five milliliters and six milliliters. And what we see here is that each one of these divisions here is going to represent, for example, two tenths of a milliliter. So in this particular case, what I can do is I might be able to actually uh, estimate to the nearest hundreds in a situation like this. So what I see here is this is 5.2, 5.4, 5.6, 5.8, and 6 milliliters. And I see that what I actually have here a situation where I'm right between the 5.4 and the 5.6 uh, measurement. So what this might actually um, represent would be something along the order of about, let's say, 5.55 milliliters as I estimated. So that means if I'm good to the nearest tenths place, I normally can then estimate out to the hundredths place. So as a result of this, we're going to see that this particular measurement would have three significant digits associated with it. So from these two examples, you can see that the number of significant figures in a particular number come directly from the precision of the measuring device. You'll also get an opportunity to do this specifically in the lab. Now, the next thing that we have to look at are significant figure rules. So the first set of rules that we want to talk about is if we're just given a number, for example, in the context of a problem or in the context of a measurement, can we actually determine how many significant digits are in that number? So we actually have some rules for this. The first rule deals with non-zero digits. So these are numbers that are anything except for a zero. And the rule is this, all non-zero digits are significant. Okay, so in my particular case here, I have one, two, three, four, five significant digits here because I see no zeros in this example. So this example would give me five significant figures. So that's the easy rule. Um, the next set of rules actually deal with zeros. So it's our zero sets of rules. And we have several subsets of the zero rules. The first are captive zeros. By definition, captive zeros are going to be zeros that are found between non-zero digits. So you see that these two zeros in this number are found between two non-zero digits. Therefore, we consider them to be captive. The rule is this. All captive zeros are considered to be significant. So in this particular case, the 1 is significant, the 0 is significant, the 0 is significant, the 1, the 3, and the 6 are all significant due to the fact that they are non-zero digits. So in this particular case, I would have a total of six significant figures in this particular number. Now, the next um, zero um, rule that we have to remember concerns leading zeros. Leading zeros are zeros that are out in front of a number here. Leading zeros we consider to be placeholders. And because they're placeholders, we consider them to be insignificant. Another way of recognizing this is that I could actually rewrite this in scientific notation as 1.36 times 10 to some power. That power would be 1, 2, 3, that would be 10 to the minus third. So I can always rewrite any number out in um, scientific notation and then determine how many significant digits I have. So since the leading zeros out front are insignificant, and I can write the number either way, 
I can see here that I will have three significant digits or written in scientific notation also three significant digits. So again, leading zeros are insignificant because they are placeholders for the number. The last um, rule involving zeros involves what we call trailing zeros. Those are zeros that come after a non-zero integer. Now the rule here depends upon whether or not we have a decimal point in the number. If there is no decimal point in the number, trailing zeros are insignificant. So what this means is if that I have 100 written as I have here with no decimal point at the end, the assumption I'd have to make is that those trailing zeros are insignificant and I would have only one significant figure in this particular number. However, if there is a decimal point in the number, then the trailing zeros become significant. So in this particular case, notice that I've written a decimal point, so any and all trailing zeros coming after that decimal point are significant. So the one is significant, zero, 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 zero are all significant. So in this particular case, I would have five significant figures. The last rule we have to remember deals with exact numbers. And there are two situations that arise here. The first is if we actually have an exact count. So I could say, for example, I have 28 people on a given day in my classroom. That's a count that I can make. I can't have a half of a person or a quarter of a person. So I consider that to be an exact number. Exact numbers have an unlimited number of significant figures. The other situation that comes into play is when we deal with conversion factors, where we're able to actually convert from one unit to another using an equivalency statement. So anytime you see an equivalency statement such as this that we can derive a conversion factor from, we're going to assume that these are exact numbers and that we are unlimited in the number of significant figures that we have in the number. The next thing that we need to look at, folks, is going to be how to apply our sig fig rules to specific mathematical operations. And the operations that we want to talk about for this course are going to be as group, multiplication and division, and also addition and subtraction. So let's take the multiplication and division case first. All right, so I've got two numbers here that I want to multiply. So we actually multiply these together using a calculator, and this is the number that the calculator gave us. So what we want to determine is how many significant digits are actually in this final answer. The rule for multiplication and division goes like this. It says that we are first to identify the number that has the smallest number of significant digits. So if I actually look at 2.5, we know that that has two sig figs associated with it. If I look at 2.51, we should be able to see that that has three significant figures associated with it. So the answer now actually has to be to the same number of significant digits as the smallest or rather the number with the smallest number of sig figs. So in this particular case, the number with the smallest number of sig figs is going to be two. So what that means is that my final answer actually has to be to two sig figs. So as a result, we have to apply a little bit of rounding here. So when we look at this, we know that we're actually significant here and here, but anything to the right is gonna be insignificant because I can only report this to two sig figs. So as a result, I see that the number to the right of the two is a seven. Seven is five or greater, which means that we're going to round upwards. So to the number of correct sig figs for this particular example, I'm gonna have a 6.3, all right? So I have to be to a total two sig figs again because 2.5 is the number with the least number of sig figs. So that means I have to apply two sig figs down here and I have to use my rounding rules accordingly. Now, if the number to the right of the two had been less than five, I would have left this as 6.2. So keep in mind your rounding rules as you go. Addition and subtraction uses a slightly different rule. In this particular case, we have to care about the precision of the number. And when I say precision, that means the number of decimal places to which the number goes out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to draw a line down here to show in the case of the 2.5, when I'm adding, I have no significance beyond the tenths place where this 5 is. However, in the second number, I do have significance to the hundreds place. But if you think about this, if I add these two numbers together, I can't have significance beyond the tenths place here because I don't have significance beyond the tenths place in the case of the 2.5. All right? So what we're going to limit ourselves with, with respect to sig figs is ultimately 
the number that has the least precision associated with it, which in this case is the tenths place. So when I put this in the calculator, it comes up to 5.01, but since I do not have precision beyond the tenths place in the case of the first number, the 2.5 there, that means that my final answer cannot have precision beyond the tenths place either. So to the correct number of sig figs, I would actually write this as 5.0. So that's going to be my addition and subtraction rule. So for you guys to practice with so you can be ready for the quiz on Wednesday, what you want to do is take this number and see if you can determine the total number of sig figs in this particular number. Practice that and see if you can do it using your rules that I gave you just a little bit ago. Finally, also do these two operations, this first one being a multiplication, the second one being a subtraction. Apply the two sig fig rules to operations that we um, just talked about and see if you can come up with um, answers to the correct number of sig figs in each particular case. All right, that takes care of it, folks. We will see you on Wednesday.